Welcome and thank you for joining us for the final webinar in our Karaman Marash Earthquakes uh, briefing series looking at reconnaissance impacts. And today we have a great webinar on geotechnical impacts of the earthquake with members of the Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance Association. Uh, before we get going, I just wanted to say a few brief words about ERI in case you're not familiar with us. ERI is the leading nonprofit membership organization that brings together people from a wide range of disciplines, both in the US and around the world, who work together to better understand earthquake risk and increase resilience in our communities. Learning from Earthquakes, uh, which is hosting this webinar series, is our flagship program. It's been conducting post-earthquake reconnaissance uh, well, for over 50 years, but we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of its formalization this year. And this is what ERI does to send teams of multidisciplinary professionals, practitioners, researchers out into the field after major earthquakes to gather evidence from the, the impacts they cause to help us better understand risk uh, and design safer buildings and communities in the future. And if you want to support this work, uh, the LFE Endowment Fund, uh, we're raising money now to make this work sustainable in the future, both for the actual reconnaissance in the field and for events and products like this, where we try and share that information with the public at no charge. So you can donate at that link here if you're interested. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator today, John Stewart of UCLA. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, thanks to everybody who is logging in to join us today for this important webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to start by um, acknowledging the NSF support of the GEAR Association, uh, in particular, the support of our uh, program officer, Dr. Giovanna Viscontin. Um, the uh, Learning from Earthquakes program that Elizabeth just mentioned um, has a virtual clearinghouse, uh, and the link to that website is going to be in the chat. Um, the reconnaissance that we'll be discussing today occurred in multiple phases. Initially, there was a GEAR EERI coordinated advance team from uh, February 15th to 20th, uh, and you'll be hearing from both of the GEAR participants in that team here today. That was followed by a GEAR phase two team. Uh, and then we had a, a EERI a LFE series of teams that deployed simultaneously on the topics listed there in the fifth bullet. And then finally, we had the GEAR phase three reconnaissance team. So a multi-phase effort, and this is fairly typical for earthquakes of this size and this level of impact to do this in stages. Uh, GEAR and EERI coordinated to publish a joint report on the three-month anniversary of the earthquake on May 6, uh, and a link to that report will be provided in the chat. And finally, I just want to point out that the uh, journal Earthquake Spectra has a call for uh, papers on a special collection. Uh, most of what is in the report will be refined uh, and uh, documented in papers in that special issue. Next one, please. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, set of speakers today. Um, let me just introduce them very briefly. We have uh, Kamal Andr Chetan from Middle Eastern Technical University in Turkey, um, Oscar Kozaji uh, from PGE, uh, Tristan Buckrice is a postdoc here at UCLA, uh, Diane Moog, uh, assistant professor at Portland State University. Uh, Kristen Ulmer um, is with the Southwest Research Institute in Texas. Uh, Rob Moss from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And uh, David Frost is the GEAR PI, and he's at Georgia Tech. Uh, next one, please. So our agenda uh, following this introduction, um, Ander will introduce the event and describe uh, kind of the overall reconnaissance response that was undertaken. Um, Oz will then go into the tectonic setting and the surface rupture characteristics, which were very significant. Uh, Tristan will talk about the ground motions, a major collaborative effort between uh, Turkish and U.S. researchers. Uh, Diane and Kristen will both tackle the topics of liquefaction, uh, an overview, uh, some detailed measurements of foundation performance and liquefied ground and lateral spreads. Uh, Rob Moss will then uh, discuss the performance of dams across the region, 
and then David will uh, wrap this up with a uh, discussion of how the reconnaissance was coordinated and how much of what we were able to do was facilitated by uh, new technologies that really helped our team. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Chen. John, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome everybody for uh, participating in this webinar series. What I'm gonna do next uh, is I'll briefly share my presentation quickly. And as we all know that uh, there is definitely uh, a story beyond the engineering aspects of every earthquake. And what I would like to do first is uh, in the memory of the lives that we have lost, I would like to invite everybody to join me for a, a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, this was a very unusual event. Uh, when I say unusual, it was unusual in very many ways. To start with, uh, February 6, uh, right by Pazarjik, you see the epicenter location, uh, an earthquake triggered. It was a magnitude 7.8. It was unusual in a sense that you see the epicenter of the event is not on the fault. Uh, it started on the northern edge of the Dead Sea Fold, then jumped on towards the eastern Anatolian Fault Zone. You see the point there. So started on a different segment, jumped on the eastern Anatolian Fold, and propagated both in the northeast and southwest directions in a bilateral way. Uh, about uh, nine, 10 hours later, another event, magnitude 7.7, .7, this time in Elbistan uh, region. And it was again, a bilateral rupture. Uh, it was unusual because you see that the intensity of the shaking was unusual. The waveforms are unusual. The duration was unusual. The area that was affected was unusually long. We're talking about 450 kilometer long, about 100 kilometer wide, extensive region affecting about 11 uh, cities. Uh, the strong ground motion uh, chain, Fidimat recorded uh, the event very well. We have over 240 stations. They all recorded the event. Uh, a quick, a few words about the intensity levels. Uh, it was a little bit unusual in a sense that uh, significantly higher than the median uh, level intensity levels we would anticipate from such an event. Uh, a quick comparison, uh, comparing Kojeli earthquake, Chichi earthquake, some typical records from Kobe earthquake, again, there's two events, two records. You can see that both the duration and intensity levels were unusually uh, large. We're talking about uh, over 1G acceleration levels. That was a little bit unusual from uh, our uh, extent. A uh, couple of days uh, passed uh, because we couldn't get good information from the field. Uh, luckily, we established some groups voluntary groups through WhatsApp chat groups. We collected information. This was local uh, Turkish geotechnical uh, engineers and professors. Uh, and starting with the third day, we were in the field uh, pretty much uh, collecting perishable data. Uh, during those difficult times, seeing your friends uh, contacting you uh, really makes you uh, happy. Uh, thanks to Professor Maas, Professor Stewart, Professor Bray, Professor uh, Frost, they all contacted us and we established the first uh, GEAR uh, reconnaissance team uh, and the first, uh, the zero phase 
was started with the local uh, Turkish groups. And you see some pictures. Then we have the phase two, phase three, following the initial studies. Uh, the event was unusual uh, because we will talk throughout the seminar uh, series uh, today that we have uh, enormous data uh, to collect. Uh, to start with, seismic soul liquefaction manifestations. By the way, we have thousands of cases, no joke. And having national and international participants in the reconnaissance studies really help to collect that perishable data. Uh, again, lateral spread cases. You see beautiful examples of it. We map those cases and still mapping some of them. Excessive settlement, foundation performance cases. Uh, we're talking about thousands of buildings that we can actually map and having both national and international teams that collaborate really helped us a lot. Uh, performance hydraulic structures, uh, Professor Moss will talk more about it, but we have a number of affected dams and hundreds of dams that didn't show any signs of uh, permanent deformations. We had to map those cases. Ports, some ports, minor damage, some significant damage. Again, beautifully coordinated efforts helped us in mapping those cases. Retaining structures, walls, you see slopes, some of them with anchors. We map their performances. Rockfalls, landslides, you see examples of it. And again, today we'll talk a lot about it. Uh, tunnels and bridges. Uh, imagine how much effort we put in simulating those large deformations in the laboratory environment and collecting that from the field uh, is a wealth of uh, information that we may benefit from. Lifelines, we have compiled data, mapped them, we have documented them and we're still working on the documentation. Fault rupture, I know Oz will talk a lot about it, about four and a half meter rupture. In some occasions it was two and a half meters and variable. Uh, social impacts, Again, uh, you know, there is a lot to talk about. Uh, I know today we will talk more about the geotechnical or geoengineering aspects of the problem, but that is out there and we need to uh, discuss uh, and, and, and acknowledge the importance of it. Uh, I truly believe that our findings will have implications on seismic hazard. The reason I say that, we usually don't model multi-segment fault ruptures in this particular event four five segments ruptured at the same time. Eight hours later, another major event on a nearby fault. These are unusual combinations. Engineering seismology, directivity effects, super rupture, basin effects. These are the issues that we are working on currently. Seismic soil liquefaction. Uh, we learned that clay soils can produce ejecta. Uh, so that is something that we will uh, definitely investigate. Earthquake building codes. Uh, intensity levels were exceeded, and I believe in the near future, we need to talk more about the design uh, spectrum uh, implications. Performance-based design, uh, design of hydraulic structures, lifelines, tunnels, a lot of lessons waiting to be shared with the engineering community. Emergency response, community impact, international collaboration, use of information technologies, I know, uh, Professor Frost will talk about uh, that. Social media, the use of social media uh, in the reconnaissance studies was unbelievably helpful. And many more, these are the things that we will uh, focus on. Uh, maybe after this introductory uh, session, uh, definitely I should end it with a big thank you to everyone who participated. But don't forget that still much more needs to be done. We're ready to the next phase where we need to perform more in-depth in follow-up studies uh, because those perishable data is documented now, but we need to turn that information into more manageable uh, outputs. Uh, and that's what is waiting for us. I believe most of us will be busy with the next phase uh, of those studies. 
And thanks to NSF and other uh, sponsors uh, that will fund us during that effort. Uh, our findings may prevent life losses. Maybe we were not successful in this event, but with our findings, hopefully in the next event, we will have less to lose. And also we're learning from earthquakes. Uh, LFE team uh, was the right uh, motto for our studies. With that, uh, I would like to acknowledge the uh, reports, which was also shared uh, in the chat box. Uh, that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Shetan. I think um, next it's me. Uh, I'll be talking about the uh, tectonic setting and the fault rupture um, observations that we had during this event. But first, uh, to put things into perspective, I'd like to uh, you know, talk about a little bit about the regional tectonics. Um, here you see um, the region, um, the African plate is moving north and the Arabian plate is also moving north, but there's a um, uh, slip rate difference, which forms this um, Dead Sea Fault in between. And Anatolian block is made basically uh, bounded by the subduction of the African plate under the Anatolian block, um, a little bit of the Dead Sea Fault, and then the East Anatolian Fault and the North Anatolian Fault. And the, um, the rollback of the subduction of the Hellenic Arc here uh, south of the Aegean Sea, basically they all facilitate a counterclockwise uh, rotation of the Anatolian block. Um, just for reference, uh, in 1999, we had two large magnitude earthquakes, 7.4 and 7.2 in this area, in Northwest uh, Turkey on the North Anatolian Fault. And these events occurred on the East Anatolian Fault system uh, in the Southeast, um, a magnitude 7.8 and 7.7 .7 earthquake. And um, Önder is, as Önder pointed out, these appear to be uh, complex structures. Um, However, lately we've been seeing more of these kind of uh, earthquakes, so maybe they're not as complex as we thought them to be. Um, New Zealand earthquake was certainly uh, complex in this sense. Uh, Ridgecrest earthquake in California is another interesting earthquake that had um, conjugate fault uh, ruptures. And so is this one. So uh, we'll definitely learn a lot from these earthquakes going forward, and it will definitely um, impact our seismic hazard models going forward. So this is the um, uh, aftershock sequence uh, of these earthquakes. This is not all the uh, aftershocks, obviously, the entire area filled with aftershocks, but this gives a pretty good sense on about uh, which uh, faults uh, ruptured and experienced uh, deformation during these events. The red stars uh, indicate significant events. Um, this one is a, a magnitude 6.7 that occurred uh, a while back. Um, and 7.8 earthquake, as uh, Önder indicated, occurred on the Snarly Fault. It's a offshoot fault from the main uh, East Antolin Fault, and it quickly propagated onto the East Antolin Fault and ruptured uh, bilaterally in both directions. And then about nine hours later, we had this 7.7 um, .7 earthquake rupture on the uh, chardak surge Fault, um, oblique to the uh, East Antolin Fault. Um, the rupture and the deformation was quickly uh, started to being mapped by various uh, platforms, including satellite imagery, radar, satellite-based radar, um, a kind of um, uh, information. But there's nothing like um, observing these ruptures and their characteristics in the field. And also, this allows us to associate these ruptures and their characteristics with the infrastructure and build environment and how they affect each other. For this purpose, um, GEAR and ERI, uh, as mentioned, uh, put together um, teams. Uh, the first uh, team that I was part of uh, was uh, with uh, Professor Erhan Altunel from Eskisher Osman Gazi University. We, we were the scouting uh, mission. Uh, our goal was not to necessarily collect uh, very detailed information, but to understand the, uh, all, the whole scope of the um, earthquake and how it was distributed and how it can be best assessed going forward. And then reconnaissance team A uh, by uh, Rich Kaler, Jenga Zildirim, and Kevin Clahan 
um, they actually went in and they collected uh, site-specific, more detailed uh, information about the rupture characteristics, such as the you know rupture mapping and the displacements. So basically, I will be uh, giving examples uh, of these observations from both teams going forward in this the next uh, few minutes. Um, these uh, points on this map that you see, um, the purple points are the reconnaissance uh, locations uh, where we collected detailed information, and the yellow points was our are our um, scouting mission points where we basically concentrated on the 7.8 rupture, and uh, we, we tried to understand the rupture terminations in both in the south and also in the north, because um, after these kind of large magnitude the earthquakes, it's important to understand how these ruptures die out, uh, to understand whether they have the potential to trigger another earthquake in the adjacent um, uh, faults, uh, such as the Dead Sea Fault in the south. Um, we'll start with the southern uh, termination of the rupture. Um, here is the Hatay Airport. Uh, we started in that kind of area. Um, we found the uh, surface rupture both to the north of the airport. Here in this photo, you're, we are looking towards south, towards the airport. You see these classic uh, initial one stepping surface rupture patterns going towards the airport. And south of the airport, the rupture starts to spread out and basically uh, terminate. Uh, in this location, uh, on the photo on the right, uh, you see very minor cracks. Uh, this is pretty much where the uh, surface structure dies out. Um, there's quite a bit of um, liquefaction and sand boils, as you see in this photo. But the um, surface structure expression at this point has no uh, measurable displacement. Um, we also did an aerial reconnaissance uh, thanks, thanks to the local um, Air Force uh, in this area, uh, police Air Force. Um, this is the area where we uh, observed uh, extensive liquefaction uh, in the Demir-Kepri area. Um, but basically, this is the area where the rupture really um, spreads out um, and dies out. Um, we utilized uh, different um, documentation techniques with this earthquake, you know, aerial reconnaissance, which is a classic method, uh, ground-based observations, which is a classic method. But we also use, for example, um, phone-enabled uh, LiDAR devices so that we can uh, quickly uh, scan uh, and document these kind of uh, sandboil features or small displacement features. Um, this, this is another tool that we can uh, use going forward with, with this kind of uh, reconnaissance uh, missions. We also looked at the levees in the area and where the fault uh, surface structure may cross these area, uh, these levees, because levees are also a, a part of a critical infrastructure. And uh, in this area, levees uh, performed fairly well um, at, at the fault uh, rupture crossings, even though the rupture wasn't uh, didn't have a lot of uh, displacement, they still performed relatively well. It's probably because uh, they don't have a lot of um, organic material underneath them. Um, they are relatively better uh, built in this area. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, we used uh, drones uh, as well as the um, LiDAR enabled uh, phones in these areas. In this upper uh, right photo, you see an oblique drone photo where you can clearly see a primary fault structure and then behind it, a secondary trace. Uh, understanding these, um, making distinguish distinguishing between primary and secondary fault structures is also uh, an important aspect uh, for designing and site selection for crit critical infrastructure and also um, building site selection. So this is important to study as a result of the survey where we have a lot of uh, where we have a lot of uh, examples. Um, and then again, this uh, uh, oblique view of a, a lidar scan uh, of a mole track uh, of the primary surface structure. And then this one is another um, example of a. Uh, LiDAR scan of a surface structure. In the back here, we have the primary displacement where you see the uh, wall, stone wall offset uh, quite a bit. And then you have these secondary traces where there are relatively minor secondary displacements. Uh, the surface structure crossed on many different uh, critical infrastructure uh, components, such as gas transmission pipelines. This is an area where the surface structure, primary surface structure, crossed the um, gas transmission pipeline. We didn't, we did not observe any uh, failures in this location, but even though there was a significant offset, as you can see in this uh, photo, drone photo. But in other places, um, there was uh, quite a bit of uh, 
uh, destruction uh, where the um, gas transmission pipeline uh, crossed the fault structure in an unfavored orientation where the pipeline is in a compressive orientation, uh, steel pipe uh, cannot take it much and then it buckles and then it ruptures as you see in this uh, video on the upper right corner. And this is the area uh, where the uh, explosion was, uh, where the burn area was, orange arrows show the uh, fault rupture, uh, primary fault rupture location. And here's an oblique photo from the ground where we see the uh, fault rupture and the explode pipe sections along it. Um, other uh, infrastructures uh, were also uh, affected. This is a, a railroad offset um, along the rupture uh, in the north. Uh, this is a photo by um, Sardar Akius, Professor Akius from Istanbul Technical University. Um, and we also wanted to concentrate on the connection between the chardak surgi rupture, the seven point magnitude to seven point uh, seven rupture and the East Anatolian fault rupture, um, magnitude seven point eight rupture. This section of the Surge Fault did not rupture during this earthquake. We wanted to see if that was actually the case. And remember, this is only uh, seven days after the uh, earthquake. So we were very conscious and we are still trying to figure out what really happened, uh, where the ruptures and where does it end and how is it connected to other faults. So we went to this location and this is the map location of the uh, Surge Fault. We found this minor uh, crack uh, on the pavement um, with no offset. Uh, so we think that this is maybe a sympathetic uh, crack along the uh, brittle uh, surface pavement where the uh, seismic waves are concentrated along the fault zone. Um, but this section did not actually rupture and, and uh, or in, uh, experience displacement. Um, going north on the East Antonio Fault, we follow the um, geomorphic expression. You see a nice uh, sidewall bench uh, along these um, uh, ridge lines, uh, uh, slopes. Uh, this, this, this is the East Antonio Fault's trace. Um, here's a boulder. This is an interesting uh, feature. Um, this boulder split during the earthquake. This piece was attached before the earthquake. This is a five by six meter uh, large boulder. And the locals uh, confirmed this observation. So our theory is that because of the uh, ground motion, this boulder got airborne and then when it fell down, it actually split. So it's another indicator of uh, ground motions exceeding 1G basically. Um, and as we moved north, uh, our um, intel at the time uh, indicated that the surface structure died somewhere around in this kind of area, but we wanted to see if that was the case and we went to it. Uh, a uh, village called Balukburnu in the north, and we found this uh, offset road and uh, offset um, uh, school uh, walls. So we reported this back to the uh, other teams, other uh, university groups in the region, uh, doing more detailed mapping. So they extended their uh, mapping efforts uh, to the north, uh, including this area. And they actually found even more displacement in this region and figured out that the uh, uh, surface faulting extended another 20 uh, kilometers um, to the north. And um, these are some of the more detailed uh, mapping examples. Um, so this is where the um, magnitude 7.8 earthquake uh, rupture uh, initiated on the Narlu fault. This is a, a secondary splay, or as we thought that it was going to be a secondary splay to the north, uh, to the east Antolin fault. Uh, in this photo, you see a three and a half meter um, left lateral displacement. And because the fault is making a step over here, you, we also uh, observe this um, vertical displacement. And on the right, this is a photo from the um, uh, Surge, Chardak Surge fault, um, uh, the 7.7 7 rupture. And right at this location, uh, we measured uh, 8.3 meters of uh, left lateral displacement. This is a huge displacement on this fault. I think the key observation that I like to end up with is when you zoom in on these uh, photos, even though we experienced you know, large magnitude displacements and large magnitude earthquakes on these faults, nearby structures um, have survived. Um, so it is very important to understand where these ruptures are and how much uh, displacement can be uh, experienced during these large magnitude earthquakes uh, so that uh, the buildings and the structures can be built and designed accordingly. Uh, even though we had a lot of destruction and damage during these earthquakes, there are also many examples that uh, structures survived uh, without life loss. So it, 
that is the main um, lesson we need to take out of these uh, events and uh, basically apply this information into um, feature design and uh, site selection studies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Today, I will be discussing the ground motions from the earthquake sequence. Um, details of this uh, presentation can be found in Chapter 3 of the Joint Report. And the motivation for this work stems from uh, simply curating the data set from this important uh, event, but also to help support the other teams that we've seen in previous uh, web webinars, uh, previous weeks, and also this week. I also would like to mention that this work was done in uh, close collaboration with our colleagues in Turkey. So this is a little, this slide, I just want to present the earthquakes that we've analyzed to date. Um, this is a little bit of overlap with the previous presentation. So obviously we've uh, collected data for the 7.8 event and the 7.7, .7, which occurred about uh, nine hours or so afterwards. Um, there have been many aftershocks for both of these um, significant events, but the third event and which closes off the three events that we've actually assessed the ground motion data for is magnitude 6.3 that occurred on February 20th. And this event was selected because of reports of structural collapses during this, this aftershock. The metadata for all of these earthquakes um, we've collected using standard NGA approaches. And I just want to mention because there has been some discrepancy between different reports on the magnitudes reported for these events. Our preferred magnitude is from the global centroid moment tensor catalog, and that's because it draws from a, a global data set that's more diverse when estimating the moment magnitudes. So these three events will be discussed um, throughout this presentation. Um, the ground motion data, most of it was collected um, from the Disaster and Emergency Management Authority, or AFAD in Turkey. Um, three seismic networks are um, provide their data through this um, resource. Uh, preliminary uh, releases of the data did include some errors. However, they re-released the data in, sub supplement in subsequent versions. And the analysis that I'm presenting throughout this presentation uses data from these re-releases that corrected errors of the initial releases. We also supplemented this data from um, ground motions that were collected through the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, so IRIS. And lastly, we're aware that there are, report, there are recorded ground motions in Syria and Lebanon. However, to date, we currently don't have access to them. And hopefully sometime in the near future, we will get access to them. So from these, ground, these three ground motion, or these three earthquakes that we have assessed, we have between about 233 to 350 usable ground motions for each event. And the reason why I say usable is because although the, the records were recorded well across Turkey, not all of the, the records themselves are usable. Here I'm showing some examples of non-usable records. I just want to point out two examples that um, came up um, very often were early termination, especially for the 7.8 and 7.7 .7 events. Um, we interpret this possibly due to tower failure at the seismic station. And then also instrument malfunctions, um, Mostly uh, seismometers, probably clipping occurred because the shaking was too strong for the, for the instrument. Now I'm going to show some maps on the right that show um, essentially PGA as, a, as the spatial variation with respect to the magnitude 7.8 and 7.7. .7. And we see typical observations that strong recordings near the, near the earthquakes and weaker as we get farther away. The gray symbols represent the locations where we don't have usable data. I just want to point out, especially for the 7.8, this data set is particularly unique because we have many near source observations of a very strong magnitude event, which current ground motion databases across the globe don't really have this parametric range, near source and strong magnitude. For our processing, I want to be pretty brief with this. Um, we use standard NGA procedures um, that were developed during the various projects that consists of component-specific processing, baseline corrections, and high-pass and low-pass Butterworth filters. And everything is done using manual selection of the corner frequencies and inspection of the resulting of an iterative process. Coming back to those near-field records, they contain static displacements or flink steps, which are generally removed during these standard procedures. But they can complicate the processing um, because of, the, of the, the permanent displacements that we see at the end. 
I'm showing on the right um, one component of a, a particular record that's about two kilometers away from the, the fault rupture, acceleration, velocity, and displacement from top to bottom. Black is as recorded, red is lightly filtered, and blue is a little higher of the corner frequency. And what I want to mainly focus on is this velocity pulse here uh, in, the, in the velocity time series, and then also the general shapes of the displacement time series. What we see with the red, which is lightly filtered, is we preserve this velocity pulse, um, but the displacements are, are very unreasonable, this very long period wobble. Whereas with the blue, which is a higher filter, we significantly alter the velocity pulse and also other portions of the velocity time series, but the displacements are pretty reasonable. Now, both of these filters do an acceptable job of removing the noise, which is evident by the fact that the pre-event um, displacement is relatively stable for both the blue and the red. However, we see these trade-offs between velocity pulse and, and um, reasonableness of the displacement. And ultimately, you can't achieve both. So our selected procedure for the relatively small subset of near-source records is to, to use the lower corner frequencies that preserve the velocity pulse, because it's probably of greater interest for engineering applications than for the displacements. As for the other metadata, we've collected station metadata um, using NGA approaches for VS30. Um, about half of our stations, we got VS values that were computed from VS profiles, 24 of which were updated from what was reported by AFAD following um, communication with our Turkish colleagues. And we use proxy models for the other sites that are represented by the blue symbols. For the earthquakes, we use the finite fault models reported by the USGS. However, we apply a 15% of the maximum slip um, criterion for trimming. That way, we're only using portions of the fault that significantly contribute to the ground motions and the shakings. So using this metadata, we can actually assess the, the ground motions themselves. And the first thing is, is just comparing them to ground motion models. We saw a, a snippet of this earlier in um, Professor Chetton's um, presentation. The ground motion models provide median predictions, uh, lowercase y, for a given event i and site j, um, given magnitude, distance, VS30, things like that. There can be global ground motion models that were developed, such as the NGA West 2 models, which include the um, Bore et al. 2014 or BSSA 14. And these can also include optional regionalization terms. For example, you can have uh, a, a regionalized path term for faster attenuation or slower attenuation. Um, um, for, for various regions with significant data. And these are developed using a global data set. Alternatively, you can have a local ground motion model such as Calais et al. 2015, KAAH15, which is developed using only data around Turkey. Now we compare this, uh, the observations to the ground motion models as shown on the right. I'm not gonna go into these plots in detail in the interest of time, but they're for PGA and PSA on the top and bottom, respectively PSA at one second, sorry. And for a more quantitative assessment, we can use residuals to assess the performance of these models um, to the observations. And a total residual, which is just capital R, is equal to the log difference of the observation, which I'll represent with a capital Y, um, minus the log of the median prediction of the ground motion model, lowercase y. When we plot these residuals versus distance now, on the top for PGA, on the bottom for PSA at one second, magnitude 7.8 on the left, 7.7 .7 on the right, the red is for the local Turkey-specific model. The blue is for the global BSSA-14 BSSA model <clears throat> without the regional adjustments. We can see that now we can see the trends fairly typical where the, the models do a pretty okay job of predicting both in magnitude and trend because the trend's relatively flat. But we can also see some issues. Uh, specifically, out at distances past about 200 kilom kilometers, we see downward or upward trends, which suggest faster or slower attenuation, respectively. We can compute um, event terms, which represent the or which quantify the the bias that we can attribute specifically to, to source effects as the average total residual where the total residuals are flat. So in this case, less than two hundred kilometers. In this case, I'm showing plots of the of the event terms versus different periods, and we can see at long periods, the models generally underpredict. Um, as suggested by the positive event terms, and overpredict or are okay for the short to intermediate periods. The last thing that we can compute is within event residuals, which is just subtracting the event term from the total residual. And with those, we can do more sophisticated analysis that um, look into path and side effects. One type of analysis could be spatial variations. And on the right, I'm showing plots of within event residuals for, um, 
for the 7.8 and 7.7 .7 for PGA. These were developed using um, semi-variogram models, which quantify correlations with distances and pre-gene interpolation. And this was performed by Redmond Portel, another postdoc at UCLA. And the really interesting thing here is that we see this very clear distinction between slower or lower um, within event residuals on the Anatolian plate and higher residuals on the Arabian plate, which suggests that the crustal properties of these two plates are different. And that's why we're seeing these path effects at greater distances. Now, the, the implications of these types of analyses are that we can use them to provide uh, reliable estimates at sites without instrumentation just by adding back in the event term and the ground motion prediction. And this procedure with a slightly previous version of the, the results that I'm showing on this slide were used to provide results to, to, to estimates at sites for other teams for, that are shown in, likely in this presentation, but also in the previous weeks. And the last thing I'd like to end on is that the ground motion data that we've collected with regards to the metadata for this event station and distances and computed intensity measures are provided as a published data set on design site. The time series themselves are not published yet. Um, we're still in talks um, trying to see if we can get them to be released. However, we don't have permission yet to publish them. But if you're interested in accessing and using the data, um, you can visit this Design Safe project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll start presenting on the um, on the liquefaction aspects that, that we observed, um, and then Kristen will continue on with them. I'm specifically focusing on sort of an overview of liquefaction and as well as building foundation performance. Um, so I was part of the GEAR Phase 3 team, which was on the ground from March 27th to April 1st, and we were led by Dr. John Bray, uh, and the team also included uh, Dr. Patrick Basil and our Turkish host, uh, Sana Begum Kinder. Um, we focused most of our efforts in Iskenderun in Hatay province, um, but we also had a day in Golbashi in the north, and then Antakya as well. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on our observations from Iskenderun and Golbashi, um, because when we were in Antakya, we didn't observe any evidence of liquefaction or impact of liquefaction on buildings. Um, this is an overview of the work that we did in Iskenderun. Um, we did about 19 building surveys that combined both hand survey data as well as LIDAR scans. The, the blue points on the, the, the figure on the right, those are the location of our LIDAR scans. Um, we focused in the Chai district over on the, the right, and then as well into the more central parts of Iskenderun. Um, and the, the numbers that are uh, overlain on these maps, those represent our estimated settlements in centimeters. In addition to the building surveys, we also performed detailed lateral spread measurements, which I don't have time to, um, to get into detail on today, but those are available within the GEAR report. I'm gonna start um, for this this briefing today with by describing um, <clears throat> our observations at this group of four buildings in the Chai district. Um, so this group of four buildings, these are images taken from the LIDAR scans. Um, we can see the four buildings, that all four of them experience some, some type of settlement. And the what was interesting to us about these buildings is that we could access the area between them and we could observe the hogging ground deformations that developed between the buildings. We can see the the, the arching or the hogging of the ground and then also the, the, the cracking and the pulling apart of the ground tiles. Uh, the last thing, and I'll touch on this a bit more in a few slides, but you'll notice that there's the standing water around the buildings. The, these images were taken from March 29th when we were in the Chai district, and there was significant flooding that moved through into Iskenderun. And this, the water, um, the water around the buildings, that's the starting of the flooding, um, which uh, gives a better image of the ground deformations and then also the settlement patterns around the buildings. These figures demonstrate or show the, the ground deformations as analyzed from the LIDAR scans. The, the contour of the ground uh, is, the both in both, is the same in both images, um, uh, but uh, just different views. And that's showing the estimated settlements of the ground. And again, we can see the hogging deformations. 
Uh, the settlements, as estimated by the LIDAR data, are up to 50 centimeters. However, there was some shadowing of the data just due to the, the, the shape of the ground. Uh, with these buildings, with these four buildings, we, uh, looking at the, the west buildings, these two, which are shown at the top here, um, we see an average of about 61 and 71 centimeters of settlement um, across the buildings. Um, and then with the east buildings shown at the bottom, there is an average of 33 and 42 centimeters. And I've grouped them in this way because we observed that uh, both the west buildings appeared to have similar construction, age, and design. Um, and then the, the east buildings as well had similar age, construction, and design to each other. And so it's interesting that the performance of these buildings um, in the west were similar, and then the east buildings were similar. We saw significant settlement at all four of these buildings, but a, um, a noticeable difference in performance between the west buildings and the east buildings. Another group of buildings that I want to um, that I'm going to show for, from the Chai District demonstrate um, and give an example of how uh, ground deformations interacted with buildings. And so this is a group of three buildings. Um, the middle building uh, is a single story steel framed restaurant called Palette Hookah. And then on the east side of it, or to the left in this in this photo, um, this is a five story building that experienced about 40 centimeters of settlement relative to the restaurant. And then to the right or to the, the, um, the west, uh, a building that, set, that experienced about 50 centimeters of settlement relative to the restaurant. And from what we could observe from these two, two buildings that settled, the, there was again the hogging ground deformation that then did impact the restaurant itself. Um, you can see that the restaurant, there's a pulling apart of the sign, a tension crack of the retaining, uh, the, um, the retaining wall at the front, and then again, that, that hogging ground deformation. And then looking into the structure at the, the floor slab, there are parallel cracks that run from the front to the rear of the restaurant. And I'll just highlight there, those here. So although there was, um, we weren't able to measure significant settlement at the restaurant, there was still damage to the building, likely due to the settlement and the ground interactions on either side of it. And then last part that I want to touch on for Iskenderin is the flooding that we observed on March 29th. <clears throat> um, the, these images here show some, to some extent the flooding. Um, the one on, on the right is from the Chai district, and then the one on the left, the more central parts of Iskenderin. We could see that the flood um, came up from the shoreline and crossed, this is Ataturk Boulevard, crossed that major road um, and extended at least one city block back. Um, and residents within the area, they reported that flooding such as this is, has been regular since the February 6 earthquakes, which is also consistent with what we saw of um, residents pumping water from their basements and then also taking measures such as sealing off their basement windows. So this may be indicative of more widespread ground settlement um, that's not just isolated to individual buildings and structures. Um, moving to Golbashi, we we spent one day in Golbashi and worked along with the team from Middle Eastern Technical University to do building um, settlement observations. Um, and I'll point out that uh, around Golbashi, there are strong motion stations um, a, a distance from it. Um, I don't believe that there's a usable record from Golbashi itself. Um, what we observed uh, for the performance of buildings in Golbashi is commonly there was a punching type failure um, of, of the foundations. We also collected about eight ejecta samples and they had a PI ranging between nine and 14. Uh, these are the building surveys that we performed in Golbashi. Again, uh, the, the, the numbers within the boxes associated with each building is the range of settlements measured um, in centimeters and also tilts if we measured those as well. Um, what I'm going to focus on is this group of two apartment buildings here. Um, where we have apartment buildings that um, are associated with each other. Again, similar design construction appear to be a part of the same complex. However, and they're only located about 13 meters apart. However, we did see significant um, settlement and differences in performance at these two buildings. Um, the building to the north uh, does has no basement um, and it did 
we did observe a punching failure of the foundation with settlements of about a meter on average across the building. Whereas the building to the south, um, Again, similar construction and design, but it does have a one-story basement as a difference. And from here, we observed about 30 centimeters of settlement of the building. Um, and these settlements um, combine both hand measurements and LIDAR scans as well, with the LIDAR scans being shown in the figures. Um, so in closure from uh, the work of our team, we surveyed about 19 buildings in Iskenderun with liquefaction settlements ranging from less than 10 centimeters to over 60 centimeters, and ho hogging ground deformation was commonly observed. Uh, the flood frequency in Iskenderun is also notable and has increased since the February 6 earthquakes. Um, in Gulbashi, we surveyed 12 buildings with liquefaction settlements ranging from less than 10 centimeters to over 100 centimeters, with punching failures commonly observed from the foundation. And the ejecta plasticity index ranged between 9 and 14. All right, and that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Diane. All right, I'll start with my slides here. So as you heard from Diane, we're splitting up the liquefaction observations. I'll start talking about some of the lateral spread um, and free field observations that we made. So I was part of the second phase team that was in the area from February 28th through March 4th. Um, David Frost is our lead. Jorge Macedo and Ben and Menzer Pelivan were traveling with me to many of these locations. Um, the areas highlighted in blue rectangles show the areas where we had uh, major observations noted in our report. Um, but today I'll talk specifically about just a few of the locations: Gulbashe, Dirtyol, and Iskenderun. First, I'll start with Gulbashe. As you already heard from Diane, there was significant building settlement in this area. We also saw several um, observations of lateral spread around the lake that was north of the town. Today, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about one particular observation where we saw significant lateral spread along the lake shore uh, on the south end of the lake north of the town. Here I'm showing some satellite imagery from September 2022, which was before the earthquake. And as you, as you can see, there are several university buildings that were located near the lake shore. Uh, there's a walkway here that leads to this main plaza. And then there's several other buildings over here related to the university. What I'm showing you now is an image with the same area after the February 6th earthquake sequence. The area of significant cracking that you can see here extends beyond the edges of this photo here. Um, a clear, nearly continuous crack highlighted here extends almost 260 meters. This is based on some rough measurements from the satellite imagery. The area to the north of that crack uh, moved north to the lake uh, and settled such that the waters of the lake submerged this significant portion of the a university property that previously was dry land. As we approached this area, we walked along a walkway, which uh, followed a canal on the on the west side of this walkway. We measured horizontal displacements on this walkway up to 10 centimeters. As we walked into the main plaza, we noticed significant horizontal and vertical deformations. Okay. Uh, the cumulative displacement that we measured were on the order of about two meters uh, across this plaza, but these measurements will be supplemented with future uh, post processing of data that was collected from drone images. Uh, the photo that you can see up here is an example of an image captured from the drone. The crack depths that we measured in the plaza were on the order of 80 centimeters starting below the bricks. We didn't see clear evidence of ejecta in the plaza itself, but there's some possible evidence of sand boils in the southeastern part of the site, which I'll show in the next slide. The surficial soils in this profile you can see were predominantly sandy with some silt and clay. 
Uh, there were also sizable cobbles interspersed in these layers. On this smaller walkway in the southeast portion of the site, we observed possible evidence of sand ejecta along the paved walkway. Uh, these relatively small scale observations were dispersed in several locations on this pathway. The two main buildings on the plaza settled and moved toward the lake. We had difficulty in measuring the um, displacements for the building with the red roof because water was surrounding the building. But based on a visual estimate of the displacement between where the railing is currently and where we believe it connected to the building previously, uh, we're estimating it was over a meter in both vertical and horizontal displacement at this location. We were able to obtain limited measurements of displacements for the second building over here with the gray roof by the plaza. Um, those displacements were approximately a half meter in settlement and up to three quarters of a meter in horizontal displacement. So that wraps up my uh, observations in Gubastia. Now we'll move to Dirtio, which you can see is on the coast of the Mediterranean. We were able to visit three locations here, um, the Fisherman's Wharf where we saw lateral spread and ejecta, uh, and Tangerine Orchard where we saw lateral spread and ejecta as well, and the Umaish apartment complex where we saw damage um, and settlement of buildings as well as some possible uh, signs of ejecta. I'll talk a little bit more in depth about these observations by the Tangerine Orchard. So we observed a large network of lateral spread cracks that intersected a tangerine orchard, as you can see here in the north part of the picture. What's visible here in this satellite fo photo is over 400 meters long, uh, and the prevailing topography of this area is uh, perhaps a mild slope towards the coastline, which is to the west of this photo. This figure shows locations that we visited uh, throughout the orchard, as well as a rough approximation of the path that we took. So beginning with this large crack we found on the south side of the road, we observed moist soil in the crack at a depth of about 50 centimeters. The cracks continued northwest, northwest into this tangerine orchard. The owners of the orchard provided access to their property and we saw several cracks throughout the orchard that were accompanied with liquefaction ejecta, including the one that you can see in this photo. This one measured approximately 10 and a half meters in length by two and a half meters wide. Prior to our arrival, <clears throat> prior to our arrival, the owners had repaired a crack that was in their gravel road immediately to the east of where this photo was taken. And they reported that that crack had a one meter vertical offset that they were able to repair. As we walked through the orchard, we observed many other cracks with widths on the order of 10 centimeters up to three meters. Uh, the depths of these cracks um, increased up to a meter or more deep, such as the crack that you can see in this photo here. Many of these cracks were accompanied by liquefaction ejecta, as you can see in the bottom of the photo here. And the ejecta that we observed throughout the orchard appeared to have a noticeable amount of fines. This is based on visual inspection, but not any sieve analysis to date. The sand boils we found were often within several meters of the cracks, including the one that you can see in this photo. This measured about five meters by 5.6 meters and about 20 centimeters deep at the, at the deepest point. And this also appeared to contain sand with some silt. We asked the orchard, the orchard owners um, where the groundwater table was approximately, and they said it was about five, perhaps seven meters deep. So that concludes my Com my comments on uh, Dirtio. Now we'll move briefly to Skanderin. You've already heard from Diane about um, the settlement and damage to buildings in the Chai neighborhood, for example. Uh, we also visited that neighborhood. Um, we also visited a boardwalk area along Ataturk Boulevard where we observed lateral spread and significant ejecta. Today I'll talk briefly about one other observation we made near a strong motion station called TK3112. This aerial photo uh, from satellite imagery is showing you um, the location of the ground motion station, TK3112, which was located on the east end of a soccer field. We didn't see any sand boils or significant ground deformations in the area immediately around the station. Um, and 
as you heard from Tristan earlier, this is one of the examples of an acceleration record that was unfortunately cut off prematurely. Um, if we're looking at just the unprocessed acceleration record, um, we can see a PGA of over 0.16. Of course, we don't know what the actual PGA was without the rest of the record, but this gives at least some early indication of what they could have been. About 110 meters away from the station on the west side of the soccer field, we saw a large sand boil, uh, about six and a half meters by three meters by seven centimeters deep at the deepest point. Uh, this was all by a well that you can see circled here in red. We anticipate that the presence of that well allowed an easier path for the soil to get to the ground surface. So this facilitated the development of this particular sand boil. Um, based on a quick survey of the soccer field itself, we didn't see any sand boils in the soccer field between the well and the uh, ground motion station at the time of our visit. Uh, we were there, you know, several weeks later, so if there were any sand boils, it's possible that evidence of that could have been erased before we arrived. Uh, that concludes all of my observations from our team, so I believe I'll be handing it over to Rob. Thanks, Kristen. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be discussing the dams that were observed following this earthquake. And this is representing uh, the observations by myself and uh, Professor Chetan and Umut Ihan. Now in our report, uh, which is the joint report between GEAR and ERI, we've documented a number of dams. Um, the GEAR's focus was mainly on uh, water dams and the ERI uh, lifelines team we're looking at hydroelectric dams. And here I'm um, trying to cobble together information on load and resistance as we move forward. Uh, here's a map showing the surface fault rupture and the epicenters of the main three events with respect to the uh, water earth dams that we investigated. We did not investigate any concrete arch dams or other type uh, dams, the ones that we were directed to were all earth dams. And we heard reports of some uh, larger concrete dams in the area that performed well. I'm gonna focus mainly on the dams that experienced significant damage. Here I'm showing the Sultan Suyu Dam. Uh, this was built circa 90s. It's about 60 meters high. It's earth fill, rock fill dam. And at the time of the earthquake, the water level was high. And um, here you can see significant crest cracking in the picture of the right. And on the left, we're down on the face and we see significant cracks on the face. And I'm co-locating uh, with the blue circle that uh, instrument there so that it gives you perspective on where we are. Um, right after the event, the water was drawn down. The outlet structures were intact with only minor cracking. When we get down to the toe, we see evidence of liquefaction and the picture on the left shows that the toe actually translated out um, due to the earthquake. Again, the um, all the outlet structures were fully functional. So liquefaction was observed here and maybe a culprit in the large uh, amount of crest cracking and dam deformations that were observed. Next dam is the Riklakash Dam. Uh, again, you can see significant crest cracking and cracking along the face, large uh, scarps on the face. Here, the, um, the crest actually spread out laterally uh, at a little over two meters, and we could tell that by measuring distance from bollard to bollard. Uh, the height of this dam was about uh, 32 meters, and the water level at the time of the earthquake was low because in this region, there is an ongoing drought and this is lower down um, out of the hills. And so there was a low pool at the time of the event. And again, we get down to the toe and we find evidence of liquefaction. Uh, oh, sorry, back to this one. Uh, again, the outlet structures performed well. Um, some minor spalling and some cracking, but no uh, significant damage to the outlet structures. Here's Yarsley Dam, 90s era, 
37 meter height, again, low water. On the left, I'm showing the outlet structures, um, very superficial cracking. Um, on the right, I'm showing some crest cracking, fairly minor crest cracking. And um, on the right here, I'm showing the parapet wall has a little bit of rotation to it. These pictures that I'm showing that have kind of the, the signage, um, what's really nice there is that the dams have the information posted right there. And so I take a picture of everyone and it gives dates and it gives elevations and lots of useful data. Uh, this one, I suspect that it's seismic compression that's resulting in the crust cracking. Uh, Kartalkia Dam, uh, this one was really interesting because um, on either side, it was a rock canyon. And so they fit an earth dam in between um, this rock canyon. Uh, the outlet structure fully functional, although uh, we, we saw some minor cracking. Um, again, low water during the event. The ground shaking here was pretty high. This was near uh, Parzacek. And um, this is an older dam, age uh, circa 70s. A lot of crest cracking and damage. Um, on the right, you see the there was a small structure on the crest of the dam, and that was demolished. And um, in the area, the left picture shows lots of rock fall. Um, on the right, I'm showing a view from afar. And um, here, let's see, um, the dark line shows the bathtub ring for this reservoir. So the high water mark, and you can see a little bit of a sway back there. And so we suspect that there was seismic compression that was resulting in those crust cracks of this earth dam. The Sugu Dam, uh, a much older dam, circa 50s, height 57 meters. This was up in the mountains, had high water during the time of the event. And um, here, I, I love it when you, you, know, you have the road stripes because here you can see the lateral offset and there was a little bit of vertical offset. And um, the crest cracking here, long longitudinal cracks corresponded with some bulging at the toe that's really hard to see in the picture, but in person it was fairly evident. And so I've circled it there. And so that, that face bulging was coincident with the crest cracking, the vertical, large longitudinal cracks, and then some uh, vertical component to that. Um, here is an older dam. Um, it's a kind of a elongated dam-like structure where there was variable deformation, uh, height about 20 meters, maybe you call it more of an embankment, um, low water during the time of the vent, and there was some damage uh, along the crest that you can see there. And then finally, um, the Urkonek Dam, um, haven't got an age on this one, still digging that up, height about 40-ish meters, uh, the water level at the time of the event, unclear, but this one actually was uh, subjected to surface fault rupture. So there was about 3.4 meters of offset that ruptured right through this dam. And here this image shows the direction of the fault and where the fault intercepts the dam. Uh, by and large, all the LED structures function uh, very well. Same uh, reported from the Lifelines team is that the outlet structures were relatively undamaged, just superficially. And then um, to end out, uh, I'm going to show one slide. This one was in the press quite a bit. And here's some drone footage, not our drone footage. This was from a television crew. So you can see very large um, cracks and very large deformations in an orange grove. There was no engineered features that were damaged in this, but this one we investigated because it was getting so much press. Uh, one thing to note is that the um, old name for this area, for this town, is the Village of the Big Cracks. And if you look at the local geomorphology, you can see that there's a lot of cracks in this region. And um, so what we did is we climbed down, got uh, right up to the head scarp, and dug out uh, some of the culprit material that we thought was at the deformation plane. Here you can see the beds are dipping at about eight to 10 degrees. The slope is dipping about 10 to 20 degrees, getting steeper at the toe. 
and there was a lot of rainfall before the event and we found a clay stone that had resid had uh, weathered to a residual it was just clay goop um and looking at some lab results uh, we see uh, the residual friction angles on the order of eight to ten degrees and then um, we had significant shaking this is down in the hatai region and so um this one looks like uh some co-seismic loading that provided the kick that released this and we're seeing um ky over k max pretty low on the order of 0.1 to 0 0.3 which in a pseudostatic sense would indicate large deformations so that rounds out my presentation and i believe i'm turning it over to david thanks rob the pre, all the preceding presentations have sort of focused on the geotechnical aspects of it. And at the very outset, um, uh, Professor Chetton talked about the, the nature of the response and the various teams and the collaborations and so on. Uh, I want to kind of bring it now all together with uh, uh, just a few slides that highlight that there are other aspects to the reconnaissance, which I think in this case made it a very successful um, uh, effort and indeed an ongoing effort. By coincidence, um, and, and I um, I joked a little with Andre about this because uh, it, Turkish earthquakes aren't happening just to improve our reconnaissance methods, but quite frankly, our reconnaissance methods are improving because of some of the opportunities and the exceptional work that's been done by individuals as they have responded to Turkish earthquakes. Um, this is not the Turkish earthquake, but I wanted to put this slide up to just remind everybody that uh, reconnaissance is not about the activities of one team, but rather many teams uh, working uh, uh, longitudinally at different stages. This happens to actually be a, a slide that Maggie Ortiz put together following uh, the Mexico earthquake. And what you can see, in fact, is that a large number of teams responded over a, a two plus month period of time. More importantly, uh, being able to share information from teams early on with those responding later benefits uh, the reconnaissance that's been done. And similarly, the work that's done by later teams benefits and fills in information that was accomplished by some of the earlier teams. So it really is a, a team ecosystem that is most important in this case. If I now go back to pre-1999, and I'm picking 1999 not only because of the Coachelli earthquake, but also this is really reflective of what reconnaissance was like at that point in time. Um, uh, an individual with clipboards, with uh, maps, with um, uh, 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 site plans, uh, perhaps with a camera uh, and so on. And, and Key to that was the individual doing a lot of writing, recording a lot of, of efforts. In connection with the 99 Coachelli earthquake, two pieces of digital technology were really utilized for the first time. And those were uh, handheld GPSs and digital cameras. And quite frankly, those were the first steps in dramatically changing how we do reconnaissance and what we do during reconnaissance. Um, gear has always been focused on the use of technology, and I'm not going to belabor all of these here. You can and look at this at yourselves at a later stage. But the bottom line was by suddenly being take, able to take advantage of digital technologies, uh, the, the person doing the, tech, the, the reconnaissance became much more um, uh, uh, successful in gathering data, but also uh, it facilitated the ability for better sharing of data amongst team members. This was not still in real time, but it was dramatically condensing the amount of time that people uh, took. Back in those days, and, in, and literally in the period between then, so the first two decades of the 2000s, there was an evolving vision of what reconnaissance needed. And on the left-hand side, I'm showing, for example, a, a, an old piece of technology now, but how it was sort of an integrator in the field for things like digital cameras, handheld GPSs, digital voice recorders, barcode scanners. Of course, today, 
you buy an iPhone and all of those are in a single device or a, 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 any Android device. And the other side of it, though, is uh, there's the, 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 the back end where you have computers, you have maps, you have reports, you have accesses to databases and so on. And then finally, in the middle of those two is sort of this conduit, this ability to upload and link data. And this was kind of an evolving vision in the whole reconnaissance world over that two decade period. The other side of it, though, was illustrated in this graphic here. And if I start at the bottom, uh, I want to highlight, first of all, that what has emerged in that two decade period is a large number of platforms going from remotely operated vehicles, various other handheld technologies, high mobility vehicles. And this example of a high mobility vehicle is a Google Street View on top of a, of a car, UAVs airborne technologies and satellite imagery. So all of those are platforms which suddenly give us a much richer ability to collect data. The block in the middle shows a variety of sensors. And quite frankly, we can pretty much nowadays deploy any of those the sensors from any of the underlying platforms. And then perhaps most importantly, the last or equally importantly, the last part of the picture that that fits in here is, you know, the, the emergence of, of uh, uh, entities like Design Stafe, which is involved with some of the data analysis, the interpreting, the sharing, creating uh, access to data sets that people people can review and look at. Obviously, the rapid facility, which uh, facilitates um, uh, equipment uh, to support the uh, people doing reconnaissance. And then finally, perhaps the third part that I think is now a very important step is, and, and I'm using an example here of a software called SiteI, uh, which is what I would call reconnaissance integration tool. And SiteI really made its first appearance um, as an integration uh, tool uh, during the response to the 23 Turkey earthquakes. Clearly, I think it's a very critical element because what it did, it succeeded in doing, was in compressing the time between when data is collected and when it is available to others conducting reconnaissance in the field. And, and obviously, there's a handheld component to it that feeds into a back end, but it allows you to capture photos, videos um, the, uh, with geolocation. Uh, you can uh, import um, uh, UAV into 3D models and get length and area and volume measurements and so on. Perhaps the most important part is, though, is that um, Following the Turkey or in the in the process of doing reconnaissance for the Turkey earthquake, almost 23,000 photos and videos have been uploaded for the Turkey earthquake. And that has involved the efforts and work of 330 researchers. I know when I was there myself, um, um, 10 days uh, 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 after the event, there were already 6,600 photos uploaded into SiteEye. And what that meant was that you could really be more strategic in planning a where you went, what you wanted to look at, and more importantly, what had not been looked at yet. Um, examples of, of that are facilitated by, for example, within SiteEye by real-time data viewing. And you can actually view this on your phone, iPhone. Uh, so this might have been a view uh, from the, the uh, semi-national level. This is showing, uh, for example, photos that were in SiteEye. And you can see clearly uh, a lot of activity along the various fault ruptures. Uh, as you zoom in, this happens to be the town of Golbashi and the lake that's just to the north of the town. Um, this is going even further, zooming in. And actually, uh, you saw the, what um, uh, Kristen presented regarding the uh, lateral spreadings on the south side. Knowing that, and when I was there, I felt that it was important to go around the north side of the lake and also observe what was there. And we did both uh, drone flights, but also we were able to do close-ups and even from the ground level, um, sorry, reporting and, and, and quantifying lateral spreading that was occurring on that side. 
that would not have been possible or as well integrated had, uh, for example, SciTi not existed as a technology. And then finally, the other important thing is, is it's not that you're just gathering the data, but you can do real-time data query. You can query by structures, by building types, by uh, geo features, and so on and so forth. And so uh, I think that apart from all of the, the important earthquake uh, benefits or, or or impacts that this particular event is going to have, I think we would be remiss by not closing out by talking about the importance of the technologies that were developed by our Turkish colleagues. I give uh, um, particular credit to uh, Dr. Onur Pekcan, uh, Dr. Chetan's colleague at, at METU, but also the manner in which Dr. Chetan really uh, led that entire team it was a team effort, and I think that was critically important. And just a few closing comments. Uh, I think georeconnaissance is now entering a new and very exciting uh, uh, level and where we can really focus on getting more knowledge out of the data that we collect in literally in real time so that we can even improve what we're doing during reconnaissance. And with that, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, David, and uh, thanks to all the presenters. Uh, and also thanks to the audience for all the great questions that have been coming in. We've answered some, uh, not all. <laughs> um, so looking at the clock, we have, uh, I guess, about seven or eight minutes uh, before this webinar should close out. And I've been keeping track of the questions. Um, and I think a few of the ones that have been asked, I think it would it would still be worth it perhaps to get panelists input on some of these. And um, the first one that I think is, is quite an interesting question is, is essentially about the topic of how have how has this event sequence perhaps changed the probabilities of earthquakes in the region? So in other words, how might this these earthquakes have uh, uh, stressed neighboring faults, for example. And uh, I wonder if uh, Oz might like to comment on that. Sure, thanks, John. Um, as I mentioned, uh, first we focused on the southern end of the uh, termination near Hatay area because we knew that the northern end of the Dead Sea Fault uh, in that region hasn't experienced an earthquake for about uh, 600 years. So that uh, long of a, a seismically quiet uh, period on a fault definitely makes it a good candidate. Um, and um, uh, to the north, uh, we know that the, you know, the, north, the East Antonian Fault experienced an earthquake and a rupture um, a few years back. So that's a low, uh, low likelihood uh, as a candidate for a triggered rupture. Um, so we are definitely interested in these questions. And one of the uh, speakers asked about uh, uh, a rupture on the um, African subduction in the Mediterranean. We are not aware of a um, subduction earthquake triggered by a strike slip earthquake uh, in this kind of a setup. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot happen, um, but I'm just not aware of one. Um, but definitely this is an interesting question and an important question because that will lead us to um, focus on areas where there's higher likelihood of um, increased probability for ruptures. And that's to the south, uh, mostly to the towards the Dead Sea Fault. Okay, thank you. Um, there was another series of questions having to do with really developing some of these liquefaction case histories, which um, you know requires kind of three things, right? It requires the reconnaissance, which has been discussed here today and is, is documented now. It requires the ground motions, uh, which some work has been done on. Uh, and we'll, that'll be refined. Uh, but then it requires geotechnical data. And so I know there are ongoing efforts to either retrieve data that may already be available um, or to perform new investigations. And uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Chetton would like to discuss those efforts. John, thank you. Uh, definitely, we're following those cases very well. We have documented the surface manifestations uh, Following that, uh, we have a good uh, database about predicting the intensity levels. So there, I believe we're lucky. 
Uh, the last piece, as you have very well stated, uh, we need to characterize the site with site investigations. Uh, it is planned. I know a number of the team members are contributing. Again, we're lucky. We're going to have a joint effort. We're going to combine all our uh, financial resources, time and expertise in following those cases. Uh, and thanks to NGL, as uh, you lead those efforts, Hopefully, once they're re ready, all those cases will be uh, shared uh, through the NGL platform with the other researchers. So uh, to cut the long story short, yes, we are very closely following those cases. And I believe uh, we will document uh, a significant number of uh, liquefaction cases. My anticipation were in the range of 30 to 50 cases uh, would be very nicely documented after this event. Thank you very much. Um, another question that I think affects the remarks many of our panelists made has to do with the, um, the, the ground motion stations themselves. And there was a question about, uh, was there any evidence of damage to the instruments or to the housing of the instruments that anyone saw. And I'm not sure who to direct this to, but I know many of you uh, went and visited uh, the locations of ground motion stations. So I would just invite anybody to uh, speak up on that topic. Um, I'll briefly say uh, we did visit a handful of them, um, uh, maybe more than a handful, maybe about a dozen. Um, but most of the time they were in some sort of housing that we couldn't actually, you know, observe the equipment directly. Um, but we did try to document all of our observations that we made at those locations in the gear report. So I would say that's the one place that we could look. John, I may have a few words to that. Uh, as you very well know, all of us, that uh, the stations recorded unusually high levels of intensities, and some of them were uh, questionable. We were all surprised with the, with the levels. So uh, naturally, as part of the uh, confirmation efforts, uh, AFAD, the Turkish agency responsible for, those, for the operation of those stations, uh, they appointed some of our colleagues and, and they inspected all those stations. Uh, so bottom line, uh, I'm just uh, passing the information from their uh, unofficial report. Majority of the stations are uh, in good uh, conditions. So uh, we're comfortable with the uh, levels recorded. Uh, there were problems with a few of the stations, uh, which is minority. Uh, but bottom line, yes, uh, those stations were visited. Some of us also visited, as uh, very nicely uh, mentioned, uh, that we visited a few of those stations, but all of them were visited, inspected, and documented after the event. Uh, I believe there will be an official report summarizing the conditions of those stations. Great, thank you. Uh, so we are at the end of our time slot. So I think uh, at this point, I'm going to um, invite Elizabeth to close out this webinar. Great, just one final slide here. Uh, thank you again to all of our great speakers um, and to everybody in the audience who asked such interesting questions. We will share a transcript of those questions and the responses on the resources section of the virtual clearinghouse site. When the webinar ends, a survey will pop up on your screen. You'll also receive this via email tomorrow. And if you could take a moment to fill that out, we really appreciate it. Uh, your responses help us improve these webinar series and bring better events to you in the future. Uh, you can learn more about ERI at our website. Uh, and we have another webinar next week with the um, folks from the Global Earthquake Model Foundation. Uh, so please join us then. We're also hoping to schedule a webinar sometime uh, in June or July, looking at the impacts of these earthquakes in Syria. So stay tuned for more news of that. You can check the webinar section of the ERI website for more uh, information on upcoming events. Uh, for those who need PDH certificates, the link is displayed there and was shared in the chat. That will also be in the email you'll get tomorrow. So if you don't grab it now, don't worry. 
Uh, and you can find the recordings of uh, the webinars in this series on our YouTube account. And this one will also be shared in the next couple of days there. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge the funding that makes it possible for us to uh, share webinars and other events like these, which comes from FEMA, from uh, ERI members like many of yourselves, and from the LFE Endowment Fund. So thank you all for your support. Thank you.